As we continue on with our survey of the animal kingdom, to, we'll start with today, this time, kingdom and uh, phallum anelida. Phallum anelida is the segmented worms, things like earthworms that you're familiar with and leeches, which you've heard of at least, the tube worms that you find on the bottom of the ocean, and this is a fan worm that is also a marine organism. So there are lots of uh, different members of this phylum, <clears throat> as we'll see. Phylum anelida are true coelomates. They have, a, they have a true coelom that is between layers of mesoderm. It's completely surrounded with mesoderm tissue. They have a complete digestive tract with specialized regions like the crop and the gizzard. A crop is a is a part of the um, digestive system that stores food while it's waiting to be passed through the gizzard, which is a grinding organ that can um, grind up hard pieces. Since annelids often eat dirt, then having having the ability to grind up pieces that might be hard is a is a definitely a, a good advancement for them. They have a closed circulatory system. This is as similar in some ways to your circulatory system, in which the blood remains in vessels all the time and doesn't come in contact direct contact with tissues. The annelids are hermaphroditic. That means one individual contains both sexes, and this is an advantage as we talked about before for organisms. The animals that are relatively solitary, um, so that any time they happen to come across a member of their species, they should be able to exchange gametes, uh, even though they don't often run across another member of their species. In terms of a nervous system, they have a simple brain. In other words, there is cephalization or the development of a head region in annelids, and they have a nerve cord and cluster of nerves in each segment of the body. Another advancement that annelids have that, that hasn't been seen in any of the previously discussed phyla is that they have a segmented body. Their body is subdivided along its length into a series of repeated parts. Now that for the annelid, this represents or, or allows for flexibility and a better motility uh, because each segment can move independently as long as it's connected to the others. Annelids are important to the environment uh, for a number of different reasons. They create air pockets in the soil. Their feces contain nutrients that can, and they can help break up soil matter. So earthworms in particular or other annelids that live in the earth are very important to um, maintaining the environment and making um, conditions better for the plants that grow in the soil. Here we have a cross section of, the, of an annelid showing some of the internal structure here. Notice that we have cross walls or segment walls that are partitions in between segments. There are circular muscles that go around this way and there are longitudinal muscles that are, go lengthwise. And if you've ever seen an annelid crawl, an earthworm crawl, you can see that the contractions of both of those muscles together helps it move forward. There's a dorsal ve blood vessel and a, and a ventral blood vessel that travel from the, from the aorta aortic arches in the anterior part to the rest of the animal. Um, there are, <clears throat> the digestive tube or the, the intestine travels through the entire, in the entire animal. Um, there are excretory organs in each segment that are called um, nephridia that help filter out a nitrogen containing waste from the uh, blood and tissues of the, of the animal. There's a ventral nerve cord that is connected to the ganglia in the front or the, the anterior end of the animal. And finally, there are bristles that you often find um, <clears throat> on the bottom edges like this, on the ventral edges, that actually help with uh, burrowing to, down into the soil and gripping onto surfaces as they move from place to place. Some examples of annelids include leeches, which can be used uh, medically actually to encourage blood flow in certain regions. If you have a, a portion of the... Uh, body that has been limited in blood flow either through a blood clot or through uh, the reattachment of, a, of a, uh, an amputated limb like a finger or something like that. Leeches can help actually promote blood flow into that area to keep it healthy. Marine fan worms are suspension or filter feeders. And over here on the lower right, we have a giant Australian earthworm. Now, earthworms are extremely beneficial to the soil. I'm assuming that these Australian earthworms that are so gigantic have the same effects, but it seems to me they're pretty darn big, so I'm not sure what they do. Uh, they probably break up the, the soil deeper down than we have here in the U.S. with our earthworms. 
The next phylum we'll discuss is phylum mollusca. Phylum, the mollusks have soft bodies and most of them have a shell or two. Um, and so this includes things like clams and squid and snails, um, octopi, and another type of uh, cephalopod, like an octopus or a squid, called a cuttlefish. The mollusks have three main body regions, the mantle, the foot, and the visceral mass. The mantle uh, provides protection and secretes the shell. It's found, it's a layer, it's shown in the diagram here in purple, that is just underneath the shell, and it secretes the shell on the outside. It's, uh, the mantle is also the part that secretes the uh, mother of pearl or the pearl, the nacre that makes the pearl uh, in clams when they get an irritant inside them. The foot is the organ that is used for, for movement. Um, it could be a single foot like we have here in this snail-like uh, mollusk or it can be divided into parts like the arms or tentacles of a squid or an octopus. They have a complete digestive system inside their visceral mass from mouth to anus. They have um, a respiratory system that, uh, that in a circulatory system. They're open circulatory system for the most part. There are um, reproductive organs inside the visceral mass as well as in their cords. And in the mouth region, they have some specialized structures in, in um, in gastropods or snail-like animals, they have this uh, rasping tongue-like structure called a radula that helps actually break up food particles like plants that they happen to eat. Mollusks have an open circulatory system except for the cephalopods, which we'll talk about in a minute. The open circulatory system means that the blood does not remain inside vessels all the time, but rather comes into direct contact with the body tissues. Um, to, for, the, for the nutrient and gas exchange that occurs uh, between the blood and the tissues. In your circulatory system, which is a closed circulatory system, the blood remains in vessels all the time and the transfer of nutrients and uh, gases and, and, and uh, waste products occur via uh, diffusion through the walls of the capillaries. The mollusks are dioecious, meaning they have two separate sexes. There are male mollusks and female ones. In terms of a nervous system, they have a brain. Um, cephalopods especially are extremely smart, and they have a nerve cord that branches into the parts of the body. They also exhibit bilateral symmetry. Now, there are three main groups of mollusks. First of all, the gastropods. Gastropod means belly foot or stomach foot, okay? These are the single-shelled or no-shell <clears throat> um, animals like snails and slugs. They have eye tips at the ends of their tentacles, and this includes things like snugs, say, snails, conch. These are some marine um, sea slugs that are in the same group, and conchs and other kinds of snails that have single shells are a member of the gastropods. The second group is the bivalves. <clears throat> bivalves have two shells. Uh, with a hinge that holds them together. Most bivalves are suspension feeders or filter feeders. They fill, they filter things out of the water with their mucus covered gills um, and the gills also take care of gas exchange. These are the animals that can create pearls. This is layers of the pearl material called nacre over a particle, a, an irritating particle like a piece of sand or something like that that got between the shell and the mantle. It's kind of like if you had a rock in your shoe it gets very irritating when you walk on a little bit. Fortunately, we have hands and we can take the rock out of our shoe. But oysters and, and clams don't have that advantage. They don't have a, they don't have a hand that they can remove the, the uh, irritant with, and so they can secrete the many layers of this really, uh, really smooth uh, substance called nacre, that is like the pearl material over this over the um, irritant, so that it becomes less irritating to them. The third group of mollusks is the cephalopods. Uh, cephalopod means head foot, and so their foot, the movement part of the body, is actually divided into tentacles or arms and seems to be attached or looks like it's attached to a head. These have, um, th these are very fast predators. They're, they're carnivores. They're very agile. <clears throat> they can move really well. They um, can move through very narrow spaces. Those that have a shell, 
include one species nowadays called the chambered nautilus and it's a hard outer shell. They actually swim backwards by um, jet propulsion. They uh, Squids oftentimes have a small inner, inner shell or the oct and the octopi don't generally have a shell. Octopi and cuttlefish have a small interior shell as well. Um, they have large brains and very sophisticated sense organs. Their eyes work just about as well as yours and mine do. And they also have a closed circulatory system, which is a big advantage for an animal that is fast and agile like they are. The next group we'll discuss is the arthropods. The arthropods are the most successful and the largest group of invertebrate animals. This includes very, many different things like insects, spiders, centipedes, horseshoe crabs, and so forth. So we'll talk about the different groups of arthropods. Phylum Arthropoda has segmented bodies like annelids do, but unlike the annelids, they have appendages, arms and legs, and antennas that are jointed, meaning that, that parts of them can move independently of others. They have bilateral symmetry and an exoskeleton made of chitin. Remember, the other time we talked about chitin was when we discussed fungi. The, the exoskeleton is basically a non-living cuticle layer that is shed as the, as the animals grow. Uh, in order to grow, they actually have to shed their shell first, their, their exoskeleton, then grow their soft bodies, and then secrete a new exoskeleton. Almost all arthropods have ten antenna, either one pair or two pairs of antenna, and various numbers of legs and other parts. Arthropods have an open circulatory system like that that we saw in the mollusks. Their tube-like heart pumps the blood through these short arteries into spaces surrounding the organs. Those are called sinuses, bathing them in oxygen and the nutrient-rich blood, um, and then picking up waste materials. They have a complete digestive tract with um, esophagus, stomach, and intestine, and as well as the, as the anus and other structures that may be present. They have a nervous system that includes a brain with a ventral nerve cord and bundles of nerves in the parts of the body. Many of them have compound eyes made up of repeating units, and that's what gives, for instance, a fly its um, greater than 180 degree uh, field of view because they can see things actually behind them because of the shape of their compound eyes. Within the um, within the arthropods, we have several different important groups. The chelicerates are um, animals that have pincher-like or fang-like structures that can be used to grab or pierce or, ta or tear prey. Things like spiders and ticks and scorpions as well as some it more, uh, less common things like horseshoe crabs. The terrestrial chelicerates are called arachnids and that includes, as I said before, the spiders, the ticks, and the scorpions. <clears throat> The only uh, currently living marine species is the horseshoe crab, and this is a picture of a horseshoe crab. Horseshoe crabs are really interesting animals. They, are, they don't exist in very many places anymore. Uh, there are a couple of places along the eastern shore, the Atlantic shore of the United States, including eastern shore of Maryland, uh, where you can find horseshoe crabs. The chelicerates are the only arthropod group that do not have any antenna. Their body structure is composed of two parts, the cephalothorax, which is the head and thorax that are fused together, as well as an abdomen. And most of them have four pairs of walking legs. Some of them have several other body parts, like the chelicera on a, on a scorpion, for instance, that looks like the pinchers here. This picture over here on the right is a fossil of an ancient scorpion called a eurypterid that was anywhere from five to nine feet long. Glad they're not around anymore. Phylum Arthropoda, and the millipedes and centipedes are the next group, okay? Uh, the, if you just look at a, a centipede or a millipede, it kind of looks like an annelid because it's got jointed body uh, or a, a segmented bodies with multiple segments, but they also have jointed appendages. When you look at their legs, okay, you can tell that they have joints and they can have parts that move independently. They have one pair of antenna. The millipedes are terrestrial creatures, they're worm-like, they eat decaying plant material, and they have two short pairs of legs per body segment. Millipede means thousand legs or thousand foot, and so they were first named by people who th thought they had, you know, close to a thousand feet, there were so many of them. Centipedes are terrestrial carnivores, and they have 
uh, oftentimes a pair of poison claws used in defense and to paralyze prey. Each body segment on the centipedes has a single pair of legs. Centipedes, centipede means a, a hundred foot or a hundred legs. And so they have actually uh, fewer legs than the millipedes do. The giant Peruvian centipede can grow up to 30 centimeters long, which is about a foot. Um, and various millipedes can secrete some venomous, venomous liquids and even spray some poisonous gases like hydrogen cyanide. The uh, crustaceans are the next group of arthropods. These, most of these are aquatic. They include things like hermit crabs and doodlebugs or roly polies, as you can see here in the little picture. Um, and also things like shrimp, crabs, lobsters, and so forth. They have two pairs of antenna, and uh, another group that's within this group is called the um, is called the um, barnacles. Barnacles are actually a sessile crustacean, meaning they are rooted to one place. Basically, they have a hard shell that is secreted on the outside. Uh, they used to be classified with phylum mollusca because people thought they were mollusks because they kind of look like mollusks when you just look at the shell. But when you look inside the shell, you can see that there's a tiny little crustacean in there. The next group, the largest group by far, of not only of the arthropods but of all animals is the insects. About 70% of all animal species are insects and many scientists think that we've only identified or discovered about half of the available arthropod species. About a hundred million individual insects, so very, very many of them worldwide. What makes them so successful? Well, they have a relatively short life cycle. The mosquitoes have a life cycle of about 10 days, and they produce an enormous number of offspring, and so they can, they can reproduce over and over again. They're the only um, animals, the only invertebrate animals that are capable of flight. Um, not all of them can fly, but, uh, but very many of them can. They have various kinds of camouflage and protective patterns, and they exhibit either complete or incomplete metamorphosis. Here are some of the examples of coloring and camouflage that you can see in various arthropods. Here's a thorn beetle. If you can see, if you, if you saw a branch with a bunch of these on it, you would think it had thorns like a rose. Um, here's a leaf bug that's camouflaged like a leaf. They change from green to brown depending on the season. So if it's if it's springtime, like it is now, they would generally be red, I mean green. And in the fall, when they start turning brown, then the, the bugs will turn brown as well. The caterpillar, this caterpillar here, this is the underside of the caterpillar that looks like a snake. So that would scare a lot of predators away. Here's a big moth <clears throat> that has eye, eye spots that look very much like the owl's eyes. And so predators that might be also the prey of an owl would stay away from those. Here's a walking stick. If you can see, here's the stick insect. It's hanging on the bottom. There's its legs hanging onto, this, onto, the, uh, onto the branch. And here's a buff tiff moth. Here's the head of the moth. And here's the wings. And it looks very much like a branch there. Uh, in terms of metamorphosis, in terms of their life cycle, there are two different pathways that insects can take. Some insects, like grasshoppers and crickets, go through a, um, an incomplete metamorphosis. Their egg hatches into a very small copy of the adult. This is called a nymph, and it goes through several different stages that are characterized by molts in which it grows and eventually gets to the size of the full size of the adult. Complete metamorphosis starts with the fertilized egg, which hatches into a larva. The larvae are specialized to feed and to grow. Once it reaches its full size, then the larvae will pupate or, or uh, produce a pupa. And if within the pupa, then some embryonic cells that are present there in the larva will actually rearrange the body into the body of the adult, which is the sexual reproduction and dispersal uh, phase of the life cycle. The lar since the larvae and adults uh, eat different kinds of foods, then they don't compete with each other. Here are some arthropod pictures that my student teacher, Ms. Zulhoff, took when she was in Costa Rica. Uh, lots of different variety of various insects that she saw while there that you don't normally get to see unless you go someplace that has a rainforest like Costa Rica. So a beautiful variety of all different kinds of, of arthropods.